Martam modga še modgoma, na dreva domo prebili. Gaza puli se me govore, vida me pamte potle bi, vida me pamte potle bi. Zogi omis kariš hamci, zogi kidem še mi dovasi. Welcome to Reimagining Soviet Georgia. My name is Brian Gigantino. On today's episode, Sopo Jeparidze and I interview Jeff Sahideo, a professor of history at Carleton University and author of Voices from the Soviet Edge, Southern Migrants in Leningrad and Moscow, and is currently working on a project that explores the meanings and significance of rivers and water in Soviet and post-Soviet Georgia. Jeff, Welcome to Reimagining Soviet Georgia. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I'm a professor at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, and been working on uh, the former Soviet spaces of Eurasia for uh, basically my entire career. Started out in Central Asia with my first book on the Russian invasion of uh, Tashkent and colonial society as it established itself there in the late imperial and... Um, early Soviet period, then moved on to do a little bit more on the Caucasus. Uh, I did feel that there was a bit of a gap in terms of research. A lot of us rushed down to Central Asia because geographically, this position between Russia and China made it seem very uh, interesting in terms of the geopolitics of the the post-Soviet space. Caucasus was somewhat neglected, so I thought... um, why don't I move to working a little bit more on Georgia and Azerbaijan? And this project, uh, Voices from the Soviet Edge, the book that we'll talk about a bit, uh, was one where I could unite people from both regions and look at their experiences in Leningrad and Moscow. Um, and then started to move a little bit more into the Caucasus and try and understand uh, both about regional identities there, um, but I did become somewhat captivated by Georgia, uh, the food, the people, and, and so I'm looking forward to spending the next bit of my career uh, working on this country. So what is your book, Voices from the Soviet Edge, about? So I really wanted to look at the way that Leningrad and Moscow in the Soviet period existed as multicultural and multi-ethnic cities. And it shifted a little bit. I, I started with really... Um, my founding memory, foundational memory of going to Moscow in 1992 was how multi-ethnic the city was. And I was expecting it to be really populated by Russians. And all of a sudden there are these people from the Caucasus, Central Asia, Africa, China there. Uh, And it reminded me a little bit, it could have been London, it could have been Paris, a a large um, Western metropolis. So I want to understand how Leningrad and Moscow worked as multi-ethnic cities. Uh, It shifted a little bit. I decided to do a lot more work on oral histories because I really felt like I wanted to interview people and get personal experiences and not deal too much with the politics, but how people understood living in these big Slavic spaces and what their everyday life was like. And as I did that, it started to shift a little bit, not just about multicultural cities, but about how people moved in the Soviet Union, what made somebody in some small Georgian village um, or in Tbilisi move to Leningrad and Moscow, why they did it, um, what their relationships with the host population were, how that impacted them when they came back, and to understand how mobility really shaped the Soviet period. And I really enjoyed working both on the aspect of the personal experiences, but also trying to commit to understanding how these personal experiences shaped the late Soviet period. I'm curious, um, I know that like the basis of your book, Voices from the Soviet Edge, is rooted in all these oral stories that you're talking about, people's personal experiences. And I'm curious how, uh, especially in the realm of multicultural, the aspect of multiculturalism and multi-ethnic life in the Soviet Union, how you uh, saw people's individual and personal understandings of multi-ethnic life versus how, say, the formal understandings of multi-ethnic life. Yeah, it was really interesting uh, in that perspective. And actually, the Georgians who I talked to were probably the most interesting group in term in understanding the difference between personal and formal relationships. So when I did some interviews, um, both in Georgia and in Moscow with the Georgian diaspora, organization there. 
there was really a sense that when they lived in Leningrad and Moscow in the Soviet period, they got along very well with Russians there. I didn't really hear any stories. Now, I had a small sample set. These were about 10 or 12 interviews. But basically, they, they're, what they wanted to tell me was that they got along well with the Russian population. Sometimes they spoke Russian fluently, other times maybe not. But they fit in in Moscow. Um, people treated them well. They were at home in the sense that they were in the Soviet Union. So they didn't feel that there was a large um, gap between themselves and the host population. But on the formal level, <clears throat> there was a little bit of a, a divergence. And so when I would talk to them about these ideas like the so-called friendship of the peoples, um, which had different impacts on different uh, groups of people I interviewed. But for a lot of the Georgians, they would say, you know what, they, they felt that they got along well with people on an individual normal level. But when you started to have these little state formulations and it became artificial, that's when things got a little bit tricky and they didn't really like it very much. Uh, so they were never really that fond of the state trying to legislate multi-ethnic relations. But on their own, they felt they were perfectly capable of navigating relationships with Georgians, with other Bajanis, with all the whole multi-ethnic mix that they met in Leningrad and Moscow, and really the major differences that they talked about were just things like the size of the city or the weather or something like that, not so much individual relationships. So I found it really interesting how you know, we have this image um, sometimes of the Soviet Union as this kind of prison house of, of peoples, but but in a sense, uh, there was a real commonality between of Soviet identities between the people I interviewed. Just on this topic, because this is a fascinating one, I mean, what was it that made people Soviet? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, I, I think for a lot of them, it was just the way that they grew up. So it was going to a school where you were, and there was a sort of mix between maybe Russian as a language, it was sort of the, multi, the, the multinational language, but then they often would use their own um, languages, Georgian or Azerbaijani. Uh, so there was that mix. There was part of being uh, a superpower that I think was a big part of their identity in the, the post-World War II period. They had won the Second World War together. That often came up a lot. Uh, and then it was their world too. And what I got a lot of people telling me in these interviews is that they could go to school. If they did well in school, the state would find them a job or they, they could sort of maneuver their way to getting a job that they liked uh, in whatever field they wanted to to, to do. Uh, they could then have a two-week vacation in Crimea one year, in Siberia the next year, and they just moved through the Soviet Union. They went to the Komsomol, you know, the Youth League. They, many of them were members uh, in that. Um, they had common shows that they watched. The, the popular culture was common. And it was for them, I think, uh, their world. And what I found really interesting in these interviews was a number of people who would tell us, you know, in the Soviet Union, we were free, which, is, of course, as a Westerner, we find very strange. But when you think of countries like Georgia or Kyrgyzstan, small countries today, where both in terms of the, the money what people might have to travel and just the border restrictions and things like that, it was much easier to travel in the Soviet Union. So the sense of being part of a bigger project, I don't think there were that many who talked about the ideology right, about communism or Marx or anything like that. They just talked about this is actually a place where um, if we work hard, we can actually make a pretty decent living for ourselves. And there was some nostalgia there, I think, obviously. And, um, we kind of look back and we think, well, the Soviet Union in the 1970s or 1980s uh, didn't quite have the standard of living. But for most people, uh, you had an apartment, right? You had electricity, you had water, you had a job, you had a life, you had a family, and, and things were pretty stable. So I think that idea of, of, of just living decently, um, having the sense of, of calm, uh, having a, a leadership that seemed to be working, maybe if not well, kind of stepping out of most people's way. Um, and then that all changed, of course, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And so that that becomes a real shift in people's ideas of what was Soviet uh, when nationality issues started to to really crop up, because that was another issue. The, the nas nationality problem was pretty calm 
1960s, 70s, 80s, and then it exploded again in, in the uh, Gorbachev period. Um, what year was it that you were doing these interviews? Uh, this I started in 2007 and then went through till about 2013. Yeah, what were the things that came up the most that people missed about the Soviet Union? Well, I, I think it was the sense of safety on, on, on one hand, that they were... Um, in the Soviet period, they could walk the streets any time of day or night, right? They didn't really have to worry. There was no no threat of, of uh, gangs or anything. There was corruption in the Soviet period, but it was kind of contained. There was a sense that you, everybody knew what the rules of the game were. And most of the corruption, maybe, you know, you'd give a little payment here or there. It was sort of natural to do it. Um, there was a sense in the Soviet period, too, that it wasn't, again, this is an odd thing for most Westerners to hear, but it was a meritocracy more than it is now. So that if you went to school, if you were in some small village in in Ajaria or something like that, and you got the best grades in school, you could go to university in Moscow and you could become a top engineer. Mm -hmm. Whereas now for a lot of the um, people in these small villages, they feel completely left out of these neoliberal projects that have been um, enacted since then. Uh, now, also, there was a nostalgia for youth. I'll say that. Most of the people are interviewing were kind of in their 50s, 60s. And so they remembered the Soviet Union as a time when they were just young and full of energy. Uh, but they could do things, right? There, there was a, a broader world out there that they could act in. And I think for the people who I talked to in um, contemporary Georgia, and again, these are average people. These aren't people who are who are, are wealthy um, merchants now or... or um, different oligarchs or sub-oligarchs or whatever, uh, they just said they, they had a, a more stable life um, and a life that was exciting for them because they could travel now within the bounds of the Soviet Union. Uh, but they could travel, they could uh, use the combination of geographical and social mobility to move, go to Moscow, go to university, get a good job, come back to Georgia, kind of get a promotion, uh, and, and do pretty well for themselves. And I think that was all tied in to the sense of the Soviet Union as a, as a project, not as an ideological one, but as one where people could live decent lives and, and stable lives uh, in the post-Second World War period. I think like we also have similar, especially the meritocracy part with our, some of our oral histories that we are doing and speaking to people, we have similar experiences where people say that if you actually were studious, if you were smart, then you, would, you could get ahead, which is so funny because, you know, my family or other people who are like very anti-communist will say, no, it was all corruption. And the question arises like, but how come everyone got an education then? How come everyone found something to do, right? If it's corruption, it usually means there's some kind of like a bottleneck where like only certain people can ever self-realize. Everyone else is unable to. But everybody was in some way or shape, form, given a chance to self-realize. So they might have been like certain degrees, you know, but still there was like there was a lot more um, opportunities comparatively to now. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's really interesting when, and I had a, a student of mine who was like grown up in the Soviet Union, and she came to Canada to do uh, her education, and she got really, she came to my door really angry. She was having trouble finding a job, and I asked her what the problem was, and she said, well, I came to Canada thinking it was all about merit, but now I find here it's about who you know, and it's about you know, making these connections, and and every system has that to an extent. Now, obviously, I had a lot of people I interview who said, you know, <clears throat> so-and-so's dad was a big party member, so he got his preference to go to this school or that school. Uh, but at the same time, there were spaces open, and there was a lot of ability to game the system, right? Uh, and I think the Soviet, in the Soviet Union, you sort of knew the rules of the game better, and there was space. So certainly there were privileges, and nobody really contended that it was a a uh, completely level society, but there was enough ability for people to move around within the system that it didn't bother them so much um, because the, the corruption didn't 
didn't face him, and sometimes they could take advantage of it. So, for example, in a lot of the um, people I interviewed, uh, Georgians and probably more Azerbaijanis in this set, a lot of Georgians were merchants too, like being able to go up and, and bribe the Aeroflot guy to sell fruit or flowers or something like that in Moscow for the day um, and exceed your luggage capacity and come back. You know, corruption could work in favor of these younger people too, um, average people to to make a little bit of money on the side. So it was corruption is always a, a word that's a little bit tricky to use. Uh, people knew how to, knew how to game the system, and I think they felt that it could benefit not just the party elite but themselves as well. And uh, in terms of the types of people you were talking to, you said that these were mostly normal people. Like, what kind of positions did they have? What was their um, what kind of uh, trades were they doing? What kind of jobs did they have? Yeah, it was it was interesting. It was interesting layers of people that I had to get through. And I started just with academics because those were people I knew, so professors and um, students and things like that. Uh, then I went with a with an RA to Moscow and Leningrad, and we met. Uh, there were various diaspora organizations: a Georgian one, there's a Tajik one in Moscow. Those people were generally professionals, so they were often doctors, lawyers, engineers, and things like that. The, the people who I had the, the most trouble getting to um, were traders, and, and these were the ones I really wanted to find because in the in the early 1990s, um, you saw so many people on the streets from Georgia or Azerbaijan just trading vegetables, fruit, tea, flowers, and things like that. Um, and they were still there when I went back in, in the... 2010s, but they were a different generation. So I had to go um, to uh, back down to Azerbaijan, to Kyrgyzstan, and to Georgia, and basically find, for, through my, my professor friends, find students who were from small towns in the south of each of those places, um, who where there were people in those villages who traded in the 1970s and 80s and locate them. Um, and in Georgia too, small village around Kutaisi where I, I had a student working, um, we also met a lot of people who were like supermarket clerks, uh, pharmacists, librarians, um, just sort of average people. And there was a lot of opportunity to come to Moscow. A lot of them said, well, they didn't necessarily know what they wanted to do when they went to Moscow, but they knew they could make more money there. And so why not go to Moscow instead of the small town that they were in, uh, in Poti or, or wherever they were, and, and just go and, and work hard. Uh, there were always advertisements. There's a lot of chain migration. So some guy would come back from the village and say, I need electricians to work on this construction project. Um, I need laborers. You can make triple what you can make in, in Georgia. They'd go back for a few years. And then a lot of them would stay um, because the opportunities there were so much better. So it was a real mix. And I really did try and privilege those people who were just working in, you know, not with the state necessarily, but just in, in uh I mean, we wouldn't call it private sector because the state controlled a lot of this stuff, but trade, and sometimes gray economy, or like I said, supermarkets, pharmacies, or the, the service sector. Or what was your uh, general understanding of how many people returned back to their villages versus stayed in Leningrad and Moscow? And I think um, it all went to what happened in the perestroika period, and, and especially with the um, turn in 1989, 1990. In 1990, was when food shortages started in Moscow and Leningrad. That's when a lot of people had to make a decision to come back. And many of them did. Um, so I would say uh, in the 1970s and 80s, people were more likely to stay in Moscow once they, once they went. They would still come back to Georgia for the summers um, or they'd send their kids there to live with grandparents maybe. But they once they started making money in Moscow, and pretty much everyone I interviewed, all the Georgians I interviewed said, they got along well with people in Moscow. They liked being at the center of things. They were, it was exciting, um, even if it was maybe more impersonal, and they missed kind of the Georgian friendliness and things like that. They they really felt they had kind of made it if they could make it in Moscow. But once you hit 1990, and there were food shortages, and also, too, uh, <clears throat> when you had the, uh, in 1989 in Georgia, of course, you had the mass demonstration in Tbilisi that was put down violently. Um, and so there's just a lot of turmoil across the union. Um, many people decided to, 
come home, um, ride things out at home in their villages where at least they could have food and they had a good um, family network because Moscow was just too tenuous and they were worried about growing um, national tension. A lot of Georgians and Azerbaijanis who I talked to said it was very uh, scary to walk the streets in 1990, 1991 if you, if you looked Caucasian because many people thought that mm, people from the Caucasus mm -hmm. had money because they were traders and merchants and things like that. So you might be likely to be robbed. Um, so many of them did go back. Uh, the people who stayed were the professionals, um, people who were students, um, people who felt that they were uh, in a sort of bubble in Moscow and they didn't have to deal with a kind of street life or things like that. Many of them stayed. Uh, so it was a mix of who, who stayed and who came back. But um, I know a lot of the ones who came back, uh, even then, they have very fond memories of their lives in Moscow. And they probably would be more, I talked to a few who, um, <clears throat> they would have been happy to send their kids to Moscow now. But of course, being a Georgian in Moscow becomes very challenging, especially after 2008. Um, it was really hard for them to do that. Actually, the, you mentioned a question that I was going to ask is um, this experience in the 1990s, immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, did any of the people that you interviewed talk about what that was like uh, being in post-Soviet Moscow? Yeah, it was hard. I mean, it was, um, and it was really funny because it was, when you're doing oral history sometimes, I was trying to get people to talk about the Soviet period, um, but for them, they don't have a clear definition dividing the line between you know, end of 1991 and then 1992 on. Their dividing line is sort of the beginning of 1990 when Perestroika had turned bad. And so sometimes they'd say things that happened in 1995 and 1996 that they, they remembered as kind of being part of the, the end of the Soviet period, um, but wasn't in terms of my chronology. Uh, but certainly once they got into the 1990s for them, um, they felt that they were often being asked for their residence permits and being stopped by militia a lot more than they were before. Um, just that there was no, uh, you know, there was inflation, there was no stability in what they could do in terms of making a living. So if they were the ones who were doctors and engineers and sort of higher professionals were, were fine because they were being paid very well by, by their institutes and things like that. Uh, but most of them who, um, I had one guy who I think he, be, he became a security guard after the early 1990s, and he said it was just, um, it was stressful, right? And we go back to that question you asked about nostalgia. And I think that was one of the things people, uh, it's more of the undertone than people said it explicitly, but life with the Soviet Union was less stressful because you kind of knew how things worked. Right. In the 1990s, you didn't have any clue what was going to happen a, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. And you knew it could be dangerous to your personal safety because Moscow was a, a pretty rough place in the 1990s. And so many of them, again, unless you could afford a driver or a bodyguard or you had a had this bubble to live in, uh, you were probably better off to be at home. Were there any restrictions that you knew of that they had, like, uh, another thing, you know, they always talk about is that a lot of people couldn't leave from the countryside to the city or there were certain quotas to keep certain things balanced. Was there any restriction from movement that you have come across through these stories? Yeah, there were restrictions both in the Soviet and post-Soviet periods. It was more how, how they were enforced. So Moscow, Leningrad especially, or what's called, it's called these sort of uh, propiska zones. So if you live within 100 kilometers of the city, uh, city center, you have to have a, a residence document certifying that you were living in Moscow legally. And that could be, uh, you could get that if you were a student, you could get that if you were a professional. They had these sort of limited residence permits. So if you worked at a construction site, you get like a two-year residence permit allowing you to be in Moscow. Uh, but many of the people who were traders or some of these people I mentioned who worked in supermarkets and things like that, they just came to Moscow in the Soviet period. And it was really interesting to hear what their experiences were, because some of them would say, well, I never even bothered to get this residence permit. Um, it didn't really matter. Nobody asked me for it. 
Then there were some people who said, oh, yeah, I, I got the permit. Uh, a friend of mine got it for me. And it turned out, in fact, that the Georgian uh, diaspora had like a, a fake residence permit kind of uh, manufacturing <laughs> um, business, actually, where they would just kind of churn these out uh, and they would be able to fool the Soviet um, police. But it wasn't um, it wasn't something that bothered a lot of people. And in fact, uh, I argue in the book that People from Georgia and from the South, the Southern Republics, because they weren't too concerned about this residence permit issue, and they were kind of quite happy to kind of live unofficially. Um, they ended up being a large section of the service and labor and construction work sector, because a lot of Russians in nearby villages who were outside of the zone, they were more afraid to come, and so they didn't come as much. So it actually allowed Georgians to be quite, um, and others to be quite, uh, high presence in terms of their work in Moscow. But once the 1990s hit, um, and in fact, the irony is that the constitutional court in Russia ruled that um, these residence permits were illegal because they're uh, they're against freedom of movement, but they're still in place anyways. Uh, and now they're enforced and they're very ethnicized. So uh, when, I, when I went to Moscow, even in 92, you could see it. If they found, they looked at anybody who had darker skin or who looked like they're from the Caucasus or Central Asia, those would be the ones more likely to be stopped. Um, and then, of course, for Georgians after, especially after 2008, if you had a Georgian passport, that was another challenge for, for people to, to be there. So there are definitely restrictions that became far more enforced in the post-Soviet period than the Soviet one. If they didn't have residency permits, how were they able to get housing, especially free housing? No, a lot of people were, um, basically, they would just go to Moscow and they would have, so it started, and if I maybe sort of go back and, and the first people, I think, to really start trading and start living unofficially, so they were students who realized that you could actually make money by, when you went home to Georgia or, or Kyrgyzstan or something for vacation, haul back a whole bunch of melons or cherries or, or tea or whatever and sell it and make a big profit. <clears throat> they started to tell friends about this. And so their friends then would sleep on their dormitory floors. Um, so a lot of people sleeping in sort of in dorms and kind of bribing the dishonors, um to, to sleep there. But then um, people would just rent apartments. And so in the 1970s and 80s, I often had uh, these Georgians saying, oh, yeah, we just... Um, we went there and found a friend and, and basically a lot of Russians would rent their apartments out and move to their dachas in the village um, and make enough money by uh, doing that. Um, some would live in hotels. Um, there were some there were some pretty cheap motels that they, people would pile into six or eight or something like that. Uh, or they would they would have these apartments. And again, for a lot of people, if you were trading, you had a lot of people in, in an apartment or um they would often just meet Russians and Russians would offer them a room in their house for a certain amount of money. And it became a pretty um, common way for Russians to make a little bit of extra cash on the side to host these people. And, and I never heard of anybody really saying that this was a, a challenge to find um, or anything like that. And another, another one that was really interesting in terms of these connections were army buddies. So, you know, one of the, the interesting counterintuitive things that happened was when I talked to people about their experience in the army, we always think of the army, Soviet army as a place of all these hazing, right? A lot of violence, uh, every unpleasant place to be. And they said, no, no, like it, when I, when we went to the army, and they said there was that, but when we went to the army, we met all these people from across the Soviet Union, Ukrainians, Azerbaijanis, Latvians, and we all became friends. And once you finish your army service, you could actually get a residence permit to live in Moscow. And so a lot of these demobilized soldiers would go move to Moscow. And if you knew somebody who was there, you'd just go stay with them. So there are all kinds of ways that people found um, found their way to the city. And that's one of the major arguments to make in the book, that we used to think of Moscow and Leningrad as these kind of isolated centers, a sort of privilege. And it turned out that what happened is that they were these centers of these networks. And the, the boundaries were very leaky between the periphery and the core. Your book uh, refers to the concept of race, racialization. And in this context, I'm curious um, how useful 
this term race that we usually use in the North American context and maybe in the Western European context is when discussing the Soviet Union and in particular the post-Soviet space, um, especially in regards to these cosmopolitan cities and the position that people from the Caucasus and uh, Central Asia have. And I struggled with the term because it's true that when I talk to Soviet citizens, former Soviet citizens, people there today, they won't recognize race as something that happened there. I mean, they'll talk more about race as a, a North American concept. Uh, but I decided to use it because I really felt that there was a, a commonality in the way that uh, different peoples were being understood. And of course, the term black or the term chorney was, was one that really linked, um, I think, the West and the, the post-Soviet uh, Soviet space at the time. Uh, the fact that they were finding these um, labels of black, uh, you know, in the case of the Caucasus, and you know, the irony I always tell people is that Caucasians in Moscow are black, right? And, and uh, the opposite of what we think. Um, but those, those terms and the way that they <clears throat> use them to isolate and the way that nationality in the Soviet period <clears throat> is, I would argue, very racialized and it's very essentialized. So people who <clears throat> are of a certain nation have a very specific cultural background with specific biological features. And I, I know that was one thing that I found very amusing when I first went to the I mean, it's in Eastern Europe, too, as well as a former Soviet space, the people think that they can tell who you are just by looking at you, right? They say, oh, that person looks like a Georgian or a Jew or a, uh, a Kyrgyz or a Baltic person or something like that. <clears throat> they have <clears throat> this, this physical idea of race, and they have a very cultural idea of difference between nations. So I, I did decide to use the term just because... Um, and particularly once you start to get to the post-Soviet period, um, you really get it turning into a violent um, manifestations where it becomes, uh, if you have a certain hair color or a certain eye color or something like that, uh, you can be attacked for, for just that. And I did find, and I, I set out in the book to find, to see what extent there were roots of that in the Soviet period. And I do think that there were, in terms of the way that nationalities were categorized, and the Russians were clearly on the top. And that's definitely something that became a Soviet legacy, but something that the um, party was also very careful to police. So in the Soviet period, before Paris, late perestroika, um, if you attack somebody on the basis of ethnic background, you could be thrown in jail and you could be um, thrown out of the Komsomol or the party or something like that. Um, but starting in 1990, once tensions arose and once the stability of the Soviet Union ended, this this term racialization um, based on these ethnic and national differences by culture, by, by appearance, was a prime way to scapegoat people, um, was a prime way to enforce privilege of ethnic Russians. And so I decided in that point to use race because it just seemed to fit what I was seeing on the ground, that it was just this really sharp division uh, between peoples. It's kind of interesting because I was reading, I think this was in Radio Freedom Archives, that they were like, that one of their arguments was that they're forcing us to be tolerant and, and like Soviet Union is. And then like, we want to, like, if we're free, then we would have, you know, love for these other ethnic groups or whatever, our brothers and sisters out of freedom and not like being forced. Of course, 30 years after Soviet Union, we see that it's absolute garbage. <laughs> if they're not like straight up being forced, like, you know, if they stop by like punish, they are, very xenophobic and hateful and have led into multiple you know conflicts so it's it's interesting how that idea of like being because like a lot of the ethnic groups will say like oh no we weren't like when well, i was um translating uh, ossetian war 2008 war oral histories and they all say like we never had this problem during the soviet union we never differentiate between ossetian or georgian any kind of sort of hate crime was punished by law. 
nobody would do these things, you know? And so this this came with the Gamsa Khudia, this came after the collapse. Uh, and so, but it's interesting how like the, in the 70s sort of Georgian like proto-nationalists had made this into, they're forcing us to be tolerant. <laughs> Oh, this, you know, of course, which is also the right wing talking points are in the U.S. Like, you know, against hate crimes or any of that stuff. You know, it's like, oh, so it's it's an I don't know, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's it, and I think going back to our earlier discussion about the Soviet Union as a place of freedom, I think that was what a lot of people said is it didn't matter so much, right? And and because the state was sort of there to police, um, and there to because I I know that. That was one thing that a lot of the ethnic minorities, um, Georgians or uh, people from Siberia um, or Central Asia, would say that they knew if they went to the Komsomol meeting, they knew that Russians were a little bit on top and kind of proud of themselves and a bit arrogant maybe or something like that. But they knew that if, if a Russian actually insulted them or attacked them, they would be tossed. And so there's a certain degree of confidence that they had there and that the state really took seriously um, – this ability to to make sure that people are comfortable. And I think it's important. Um, but it's true what you said, and and I think I, I get that too, and I got that from the Georgians I was interviewing, that they would um, they would also say, oh, yeah, I, I got along with people and the state didn't need to force us. Um, part of that too also comes from just the economic stability in the 1970s and 80s, right? There wasn't that sense of competition. And once that happened in the early 1990s, um, I think that that uh, changed a lot. And the Soviet Union, I mean, they had sort of baked in these categories and allowed them to, to then um, fester. Uh, now, I don't think they did so with malice. I mean, I think there was a sense that people should have a national identity that they should be proud of. And, and uh, they tried quite hard to have different layers of education and different um, languages and things like that. But uh when you got this combination of economic hardship, um, political upheaval, and then you had these Gams Accordia people coming in able to exploit this, uh, it really changed the way that Georgia uh, looked in the 1990s, and, and not just Georgia, but many places in the Soviet period, post-Soviet period. Was there a lot of difference of opinion about how and why the Soviet Union collapsed between people you spoke to? Or was it pretty uniform as far as what they attributed to causing the collapse of the Soviet Union or the end of the Soviet Union? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, there were some differences. And I think uh, some of them uh, would say that, well, the Soviet Union was perfectly fine. It was just stolen by politicians who had their own agendas and wanted to, to grab power. So I think that was one set of responses. And they said, oh, common people in the Soviet Union, we all got along. You know, life was pretty good until Gorbachev came, came around. And then under his wing, this whole new uh, generation of leaders came who didn't have a loyalty to the Soviet Union. Um, the others did. <clears throat> I mean, that was probably the most common one, because I think generally people felt that up until 1990, uh, things were going pretty well for them. Um, yeah, there were some problems in the Soviet period, for sure. Um, but if you weren't a dissident, you weren't really that unhappy necessarily with how, how the state went. Um, now, there were some who were more politically um, active, who would talk about the fact that the Soviet Union had barricaded itself off from the rest of the world, um, that it really was a closed political system, uh, and they would talk about um, the various degrees of censorship that, that had happened and that this was maybe a good thing, and also um, that it was positive that the some of the nationalities got freedom from the um, Soviet period, the, the Soviet sort of grasp as well. Uh, so I think both of those happened. I mean, it was blamed a lot on the leadership, but both in positive and negative fashions. Um, I don't think anyone I really talked to said there was any um, popular desire for the Soviet Union to end, that it was just something that it was their, it was their reality. And I talk to people about this, um, and some of my students, and I say, well, it's, it's hard for us to imagine living in a system that's not neoliberal, capitalist, or anything like that. That's sort of our reality, just as the Soviet Union was theirs. Uh, 
So it's very difficult for them to, it's very difficult for them at the time to conceptualize it. And I think that's why so many of the people have, like, why the 1990s were so tumultuous, was that people were tossed into a system that wasn't of their making um, and having to survive in it. Right. I think uh, the interesting thing is that, not interesting, the sad thing is that it's often touted by the West that uh, disintegration of the Soviet Union was wanted by the people. And this was done by the people because they've been right. wanting to be free for a long time. And not that it was like very small percentage of dissidents that were constantly vying to end it. And then sort of the yeah. elites that like, whatever, stopped. They realized that they could make way more money <laughs> and have way more power under capitalism, right? So right, 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 right. Um, it's interesting in Georgia. So what they do, you know, there was like that Soviet poll, right? That they were like asked all these questions all these countries or well, not countries but like all these regions do you want to stay in the soviet union do you want it to disintegrate and it was like most of them said no but gamsa mm-hmm. in georgia refuses to boycott the, the the questionnaire or whatever the poll refuses to even ask people because i think he knew the answer right. and then instead he mm-hmm. gives another poll later which is, do you want Georgia to go back to its pre, like whatever, 19, I think 17, 19, 20, whatever, b- b- borders? Which is like a, you know, it's a question that's a bit ambiguous. Because the, do you want to say the Soviet right. Union was actually as a sovereign nation as well, as together as part of it. So that's a bit, something that's, I think, part of what we're also trying to do is a little bit like explain sort of the people's history of the Soviet Union. You know, it's like most people, weren't dissidents most people <laughs> didn't have a bad time but it's actually had a pretty comfortable life um this idea that material very like yeah. high amounts of consumer goods somehow being the only way people are describing happiness right it's like the west has more consumer goods and therefore must be more free and happy like this mm-hmm. is somehow the way things are sort of set up um, yeah i mean i, I get I get sort of, a, and one of the things I talk about in the book was that I, I get what I what I realize is now we grew up in the West in the 1980s of images of the Soviet Union as being these grocery stores, you know, without any goods in or anything in them. But what I found out in my in my research was that if you went to a market in Moscow, it would be filled with fresh produce from Georgia and Azerbaijan, and and people had fruit and they had vegetables and they had jobs and they had these kinds of things. And, and, you know, you talk about sort of the, the human relations too. And I, I, I know a lot of um, Georgians, I was just reading through some of my interviews yesterday who were in Moscow in 1989 when the riots happened in Tbilisi. And they said, well, after the riots, all my Russian friends came up to us and asked us how we were wanted to support us and they all they went to Red Square and laid flowers for the rioters and and that there was a sense of solidarity of people at that point. Um and I, I didn't I, I didn't have one person, one Georgian, who said that they had any problems with Russians right in the Soviet period. Oh, we got along well. And in fact often they would say I got along at least as well with Russians as with other Georgians. So um it was much it was Really a sense, and again, I, I, I don't disagree that there's some nostalgia here because life is more difficult and there's some nostalgia when you're young. But I, what I argue in the book is that you have to take these things seriously. If people would give me very concrete examples of living happy lives, of living lives where um, they could dream that their children could go and work anywhere in the Soviet Union, go to medical school, be an economist, do these kinds of things. And I think that was, that's what people really thought about when they engaged success. And I, doing the oral histories is really interesting because you, you put people in a situation where they kind of re-narrate their lives and try and understand different points of inflection. And as they do that, you, they start to, to think about the Soviet period and they think about, yeah, we had a lot of opportunities, uh, when we were, when we were there. And, and like you say, maybe not the, the the mass consumerism of the West, but they didn't really miss that. 
either. I mean, they could go, some people who did, they could go to Prague and, you know, there was more goods available and things like that. But that wasn't, that never came up in our conversation. So this is something that they, they really felt they, they missed. Jeff, you are also, from what you've told me, working on another book, another research project about Georgia. Um, Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, so I started to work on rivers in Georgia in the late imperial and Soviet periods. And this was a little bit of a a sort of coincidental, arbitrary decision that I made. The first time I came to Georgia was 2009. Um, And actually, that that was a period where, even though I thought that it would be my my Russian is I, I, between English and Russian, I can get I get around. People didn't care if I spoke Russian or English or not, right? It's a very human kind of element um, to that, which was nice. That right after the two thousand eight war, I was thinking if I spoke Russian, that would be very uh, um, <laughs> prejudiced against or or something like that. But anyway, so I'm there in two thousand and nine. Um, t- working on a teaching project with the Soros Foundation, and we were had a seminar with a bunch of other professors from different um, post-Soviet republics. Uh, and it was my first time experiencing Georgian food and Georgian hospitality, and just how beautiful Tbilisi is. And I thought, gee, I'd really like to do a project here. And then I at the when I was at the hotel, there were all these images of old Tbilisi, and one of them was. Um, an image of Tbilisi uh, in the late 19th century and the corridor of the Mktvari River um, flowing through the middle and people uh, pushing log booms down it, which reminded me of when I was a kid in British Columbia, Canada, uh, the Fraser River, we have all these log booms. Oh, it would be really interesting to understand how rivers worked and also how to integrate nature and society, which has always been something that I felt I've been missing in my work, really trying to understand nature as a force. And as I started to to look at Georgia and realized 26,000 rivers or something like that, a massive number in Georgia, um, and that these were really important channels for all kinds of things, from cultural identity to hydropower um, to regionalism, regional contestation, uh, I thought, okay, I'm just going to take a look and see what's important here and how rivers define Georgia, how rivers sort of power Georgian society how rivers and society coexist. Uh, so I'm at the beginning stages of the project now, but it's been really interesting to see um, how Georgians, both culturally, socially, and economically, um, understand how rivers work, and also how rivers work with space. And of course, central Tbilisi now, the, the Mekvari, the Kura River, has been changed over the, the centuries. Um, they try to tame it, but of course it flooded, that had a massive flood in 2015. Uh, and hydropower still, and it's probably even more important now in independent Georgia uh, than it was before. So I'm focusing on all these kinds of things as I'm trying to understand how um, Georgia deals with nature through rivers. And in terms of um, you're talking about the imperial period and then the uh, Soviet period, what kind of differences, at least in your initial research, have you come across between, say, how rivers uh, and bodies of water are understood, dealt with, interacted with um, in the imperial period versus the Soviet period? It's interesting. And in fact, there was less, it was less firm a divide than I, I thought. I mean, obviously, uh, the Soviet period was a period of dam building. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. But the idea of using water for hydroelectric power really originated in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and even the Grand Duke in Borjomi had a hydroelectric project that he began with uh, German and Swiss engineers. Uh, the Tbilisi City Council in the 1880s and 1890s wanted to use hydropower to, to power street lamps. In the city, and it was it was felt before the Soviet period. This was what they called uh, ultimately white coal or white gold uh, to use as an energy source, uh, and that was all existing there in the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties. But with the Soviets, what they really wanted to do was to use rivers and water as a key plank of modernization of the entire republic. So it was about hydropower and dams and um, the 
is Emma of Charlestown, which was the first one in the late 1920s, early 1930s, which became the symbol of Soviet modernization. And this massive statue of Lenin, which people from the Soviet period will remember, was um, above the dam, the very first sort of pointing Lenin, uh, which is quite famous, became quite famous in Soviet art. Uh, but there was the decision to try and use rivers to uh, irrigate agricultural land so Georgia could contribute to the Union economy um, in a sort of modern state. Uh, it would have its own power source. It would be part of a regional grouping with Azerbaijan, especially in order to be uh, states once were backward, uh, now had become um, industrialized, use it to start to power chemical industries and things like that. Uh, and it was a uh, something that was shared with Georgian nationalists, obviously after the Civil War, of course, when we, we did have um, conflict. But a lot of Georgians at the time, too, had this same dream that we want Georgia to be a modern republic. And water is the best way to, to do this. It's a major resource that we have. Um, and just like anywhere else in not only the Soviet Union, but in the West, let's channel rivers. And this is kind of the sad thing if you're an environmentalist, like let's tame rivers. Let's turn them almost into canals where we can predict how they flow. We can siphon amounts off that we need for agriculture, that we need for dams and things like that, um, with really sad environmental consequences. But as we can see by the um, acts of an independent Georgian government today, right? Hydropower is still a plank that they consider uh, critical, right, for for the progress of the country. Um, what What's interesting is that I'm, I keep saying the same thing. What's interesting, <laughs> but anyway, during the Soviet Union, a lot of the demand for dams was uh, because they needed energy source because they had you know factories they were like producing things right they needed multiple sources mm -hmm. of energy what i'm seeing in difference is that the government keeps trying to make that same argument now except there's like nothing there's no fact there's nothing there's no industry right, right? so like the dam is really for whatever the so-called what they're trying to probably do is to export it or whatever whatever the private company does with it and so it's also addition of like sort of Bitcoin farming that's happening a lot. Mm -hmm. And so like it's, you know, arguing with my aunt and, and my uncle yesterday over these dams, they're like, but of course that we have so many rivers, but of course we should use them. We should try to tame them and use them for the public good, except there is no public good with this. It's, it's not really funding any industry. It's not going to in any way uh, help us, right? Most of, mostly. And also the terms of the agreement is horrendous right. between the private company and, and Georgian government. It's one, well, we have just so many bad contracts, it's hard to say which one's the worst, but in general, <laughs> um, that we know of. So, it's, I mean, I guess like, and the, my favorite part is that all of a sudden, um, these anti sort of Soviet, Soviet researchers, researchers came out and said, oh, this is the blame of the Soviet Union. This whole entire yeah. damn project is the blame of the Soviet Union. And so yeah. they somehow found a way to blame today's 2021 actions <laughs> through the Soviet Union, saying, oh, they were the pioneers of the Mega Dam project. Completely, you know, no con continuity to why that was used then. Plus, there was also no solar or wind power back then. There's, you know, no other really other sources. So it's like, it's, it's incredible to me how they always find a way back into some kind of anti-Soviet discourse. And I guess, like, what would you say to that? Like, what would be your analysis, as much as you do know about this? Yeah, I, I think I would I would agree that this sort of blaming of the Soviet Union ignores historically the fact that water has been this symbol of modernization that sort of united Georgians who worked um, both before the Soviet Union and under the Soviet Union. There was this large <coughs> consensus that <coughs> this was going to modernize the republic, but also in the Soviet period there's a sense that this would make life, people's lives better. And this is not unusual. Now, you mentioned wind and solar now, but also before the 1970s, 1980s, 
<coughs> even in the West, we did not have this idea of the environmental damage that dams were causing. And a lot of the Soviet dams were actually quite small scale and so far, so probably less damaging than the ones that are being built now. Um, there was certainly uh, environmental issues, but in fact, the Georgian nationalists who protested um, some of these dams often did so because they were taking uh, energy or they were potentially taking things away from Georgia. So the Iraq v. Gorge protest in the, in the uh, Glasnost period, where you're right, in the Soviet period, hydroelectric uh, the hydroelectric good was meant to stay in Georgia or to or to provide Georgia as a supplier with the Soviet Union. It was a, you know, it was a, quasi a quasi-colonial economy. There's no doubt about that. But I would say it's quite different in, in, in what you said, too, that uh, right now what happens in Georgia is the state assumes all the risks for these dam projects. And all the profits go to multinational companies, and it's with Turkish company or, or Swiss companies or something like that. Um, and the idea is they'll either get the export um, of the energy or they'll get the, the, the money um, from selling energy locally. And so this understanding of the multinational element, I think, really knocks down any sense of continuity between the Soviet period and, and the fact we have an environmental consciousness now. Um, so there's a, there's a consistency in government desire to develop these um, raw resources because Georgia doesn't have a lot else uh, in terms of raw resources. It's, it's really profitable. Um, but the Soviet period, at least you had some kind of sense that this was to be kept domestically. Whereas now it's it's very much about a, a strategy that the government is using um, to gain favor with foreign governments, and you know I'm I'm less privy to the contracts than than most, it's sort of outside of my area. But I have to imagine in terms of scale of corruption and things like that, there's a lot more going on now than there was then. Where else do you see your research going regarding water in Georgia? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand, and I think this is one of the one of the things I hinted at earlier on, is how water works at an everyday level. So it continues my um, my project uh, before, and I want to find out what rivers meant to Georgians at the time. So I'm just starting to get glimpses of the fact that each region in Georgia had a sort of so-called mother river, right? It's one that that was a basis of an identity. Uh, and there's all kinds of mythologies associated with that and how that works in terms of regional identities uh, in Georgia. Then also um, things like daily activities. So hunting and fishing, I think, was a big a big one that changed in terms of the way that dams were constructed, in terms of the way the ecosystems worked, and how rivers operate, you know, the, this desire to tame rivers versus impossibility of taming rivers. And of course, everybody in Georgia knows about the, the 2015 flood in Tbilisi, but I mean, floods um, and these kinds of things were really uh, part of trying to understand how um, how people had to deal with an unpredictable uh, natural flow. So looking at the local level, uh, looking at the way that people really felt that rivers were part of their identity, um, trying to understand, too, how the environmental movement grew in the 1980s and how rivers became um, important to that and how these national um, elements started to form in Georgia in the 1970s and 1980s. And was the environment just sort of a cipher for national feeling? Were these people really sincere environmentalists? And, and that's something I'm still right at the beginning of, of looking at. Because um, I mean, it's so interesting with Georgia how the national movement evolves from from the time of the 1956 uh, anti-Stalin, anti anti de protests um, to what happens in in the Glasnost period. Uh, so that sort of get, gets getting away from rivers a little bit. But using the environment is trying to understand what it meant to Georgia as a nation in the late Soviet period as well. Um, so trying to get those sort of daily issues. So I'm less. A little bit less concerned with sort of how dam building <clears throat> affected the Georgian economy, but more about how it affected people's lives. So people who were displaced by dam building, what happened to them? Uh, what happened to the marshlands? What happened to these areas? How that affected Georgian ecosystems? 
Uh, it's a bit of a challenge because I'm not trained in, in terms of geology or these kinds of things too. But uh, I think it's really important when you have the number of rivers and the number of dams you have in Georgia and the way river structure thought um, and identity, um, how that all works. Yeah, I think the, it, the identity part and, the, and the, the meaning of these things, I think seems to play a big role in the movement against the dam that's been very successful as far as garnering nationwide support and even uh, abroad, you know, having like, uh, you know, they had like protest actions in Berlin and France and so on. And so that somehow has hit a nerve and seems to be a source of a lot of sort of pride and identity that's, that's keeping a lot of people very connected to this movement, which unlike, you know, I'm a labor union um, leader here and having worker related strikes and so on, we don't get that same sense of identity and pride. Um, so like, I guess it's the meanings around these rivers are kind of interesting and they might be even decisive in if people, if this is going to be a victory for the people or not today. Yeah, I think, I think there is a real connection to the, to the natural world and to the way that rivers structure um, thought and life, right? At the same time, because it, this is going to make a major difference to the way people um live their lives if they're going to be displaced. But it's also making a difference to the way people experience their own thoughts and ideas if they have to move to an area that that doesn't have the nature the natural background or the natural um world that they thought. And I think that's why one of the reasons why I started working on reverse when I go back to that uh picture I saw of the the McVary and the the log was slowing down. And I remember how important rivers were to my own sense of identity growing up where I was growing up. And water, you know, rivers, oceans, um, it, it really ties you to place. And I, I really, I want to explore that a little bit more. And I mean, I don't intend to be reading a, a ton of novels or, or poetry or something like that, but I, I have a sense that a lot of this is quite prominent in Georgian um, culture. And certainly there are mythologies, um, uh, stories about rivers and creatures and things like that that I think are very important to people and and, and fuse generations together as well. Um, yeah, you know, this is uh, one, you know, that we're talking about this way that towards the end of the Soviet period, environmentalism was being used as kind of a conduit to... Um, uh, feed or fuel national tensions and, or nationalist uh, mobilizations is maybe a better way to put it. Um, it's interesting how uh, during the Soviet period, there was a promise of modernization through the use of rivers um, that would connect Georgia not only to um, the rest of the Soviet Union, um, and promised the Soviet form of modernization, um, but would also, um, like you said, retain some of these, uh, it would give something back to the place that these development projects were happening. Um, it wasn't some kind of full, fully colonial uh, or, uh, relationship. It was actually something um, that was going to be rooted in the place. But it's interesting now how with the current dam protests that nationalists um, are also trying to take advantage of um, uh, opposition to the hydro the hydroelectric dam that's being built um, and trying to sort of orient the environmentalism uh, against that's being, you know, real critiques of some of this uh, development um, as being a, a question of nationalist uh, sovereignty against the Turkish colonialism or whatever. And I guess I'm curious uh, what you think about this ability for nationalist politics to kind of take hold of real legitimate environmental concerns. And how do you, um, how do you, I guess, weigh both the importance of nature, the earth, 
the rivers to people's national con to people's uh, understandings of themselves, their love of place, uh, their own identities, and this other possibility of the sort of long-standing relationship between the far right nationalism um, and ethno-nationalism with a kind of environmental romanticism. Um, I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, I think there's definitely this element of entrepreneurship going on in terms of trying to capture nationalism and use it as a vehicle on both sides, right? So the, the one that you mentioned in terms of people who are trying to oppose the dam using nationalist rhetoric. But I know um, one of the things the Georgian government was doing um, recently as a few years ago, maybe they're still doing it, was to argue that a lot of the NGOs who are opposing dam construction are funded by Russia have some kind of foreign agenda and they're anti-nationalist too. So both sides, I think, are trying to enforce themselves as um, nationalist agents in terms of their visions of the country, right? So it becomes um, very contested and it's about who can control the vocabulary, right? And who can control the way that people understand and see uh, the environment in terms of a nationalist uh, agenda. And I think sometimes that can be more powerful in the moment when things become contested, uh, that the nation becomes ex or nature becomes exploited in this case. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see, because I, I, I agree with our conversation earlier that a lot of the passion of these protests has been driven by these identity issues and these sort of natural issues and things like that. Can this be sustained when um, a lot of the bigger economic questions um, and the bigger questions of political influence uh, become uh, central. And that I'm not so sure about. And I, I know in Georgia it becomes very tricky because these damn protests, uh, and they're, they're very frequent, right? And it seems very difficult for these protesters to get a, to get some kind of hold of um, the political uh, agenda in Georgia, right? And you guys will probably know this better than I would, but I think that the... Um, this this part of this identity uh, tying of people to rivers mm -hmm. becomes sometimes very difficult to mobilize politically and um, in the long term in terms of actually making a difference in terms of power relationships. So it'll be really interesting to see how these damn protests evolve because you are getting um, a level of passion, I think, and a level of popular support. And the government itself is quite weak. Um, so how will that play out? I, I It'll be fascinating to see. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think overall, uh, the like there. I don't know if there's like a precedent to actually be able to. It has nothing to do about dams or water or any of that. It, it's really about the idea that a small country can just break multinational contract with a multinational and yeah. got free, right? Like, and just get away with this. I think at the end of the day, it goes back to mm. not the water issue, not the dam, not the environment, but these, you know, hierarchies of sort of global capitalism right. that exists. Um, and, and sort of the weaker, it's been so weak, right? There hasn't been a global movement sort of anti- um, globalization like it used to be and so on and so right. um, even the fact that you know we don't even have it's patented drugs still even for um, coronavirus uh, vaccines so yeah I think that's going to be the decisive one but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that finally there's more pushback you can't just do whatever you want here you know? it's right. like, right. and right. reach like a certain level because it's just right. been People are, you know, traumatized, honestly, from from to go back to the beginning of our conversation. People had a comfortable, normal life, and all of a sudden, the, the rug was pulled out of them, and they yeah. haven't made sense of it yet. They haven't made sense of first even try to survive, and they haven't made sense of what the hell happened and and how to go, how to mm -hmm. what to do something about it. You know, it's really been a very chaotic, unstable thirty years. 
Yeah, and I, th- I think even going back to to doing some of the the research I did and on the the core of the Mikvari in Tbilisi after the Soviet period, all of these buildings, you know, the the massive government buildings they put up, the condominiums they put it right on the edges of the the river. The fact that they've kind of taken away a lot of the sidewalk area to to favor roads and things like that. And none of this has gone through public consultation. None of it's been tendered or anything like that, right? It's it's about all these sort of backroom deals and these these visions often by foreign, I mean, it doesn't I don't know how much it matters, but by foreign architects, the whole the, the tubes and those kinds of the park that kind of cuts the river off from the rest of the city. Um, all these chances, and Tbilisi is not alone in this, these chances to remake the cities after the Soviet period. Um into ones that were maybe more environmentally friendly or more human. Uh, and the opposite has happened, right? I think um, when you look at the, and I love Tbilisi, and I, I, obviously there have been some things that have, have really uh, improved, but you look at the, the, the amount of traffic, right? The, the, the challenges on a human scale. Uh, a lot of these things have just been left behind and you sort of wonder how long it can go on like this unchecked. I don't know. Any last comments? I, first of all, I want to thank you so much. It's been really interesting. Can't yeah. wait to read your book. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. But do you have any final, yeah, any final comments, last comments you want to say? Or I think it's a fantastic project to try and accumulate right all of these memories of the Soviet period and and trying to understand it because I, I think especially in Georgia, it gets lost so much in the nationalist narrative, right? Of the um, of the 1980s, late 1980s and early 1990s, and uh, again, when I when I did my interviews in uh, of these people who were living in this, you know, they were young in the 70s and 80s, uh, how just they enjoyed their daily lives, right? And and I think that's really what gets lost in the sense that the Soviet Union had some kind of hold on people's consciousness. Right? The people weren't independent actors. Uh, and to me, I listen how people made choices in the Soviet Union. Right? They were almost, if, almost more free in the way that they could think of things because they had that level of stability. Um, yeah, maybe, especially now in the, that these states, you don't necessarily have. But you could choose where you, where you went to school. Right? You could choose where you went to work. Um, there were obviously just like there are in um, in the West, right? There, there are limits, right? You're you're trained in a certain way, or you have certain interests. But nobody ever told me, um, you know, the state said I couldn't do this, or the state said I couldn't do that. Um, now, you know, there, sometimes people would have to wait a certain amount of time to get an apartment. There are all these kinds of things, but um, people had systems and they made things work. Uh, so no, I'm not saying that the Soviet Union was some kind of uh, panacea. I mean, there were reasons why it collapsed and, and the the economic system was was somewhat unstable. Um, but it was much more as much the political entrepreneurship as anything else, right? That that collapsed it. Uh, and I I just saw really strong sense of, of human relations in in the Soviet period that I thought was really fascinating and how people. Like time and time again, people would say, "Like we we all, we work to help each other out," um, and that was kind of a nice thing to hear. You know, one of the saddest things that I hear is like from old, from a little bit older generation is that they they you know they they had like going to each other's houses a lot and socializing, mm-hmm. and you know they always brought like chocolates or something. It's like some sort of like a thing, and then. Be, being really poor now, they actually don't socialize as much because they're too ashamed to go without a gift like a chocolate. And same thing is that they are ashamed to have in, like invite guests and not have you know a good amount of food or whatever for the guests. So like that being really unstable, their ability to entertain each other, or go see each other, has affected their social life. And so that was kind of a Sad thing. Yeah, it's it's really hard because I know when I was in I was in Chelyabinsk, um, colleagues of mine, and basically people at the same level of um, professional level as I am, getting paid uh, less than a graduate student stipend, and so they're having to work three or four jobs. They're living in some um, 
very dangerous apartment with that you know, chemicals and things like that, especially in this, these uh, old Russian industrial towns. Um, they don't have any time at all, right? And I think time is sort of, and, and other people have talked about this, but I, I know when I talk to people in the Soviet, you're talking about visiting and social sociability. I say, oh, in the Soviet Union, after work, we could go to the park and buy our kids ice creams and just walk around. And um, now that's, you're working much harder. So if you're an average person, um, life becomes really difficult. And I think probably too, what, what will be interesting doesn't involve my project, but when you see the sort of depopulation of a lot of the smaller towns in Georgia and everybody moving to Tbilisi um, because of the lack of opportunities in smaller regions, I think that becomes really problematic. And that's something the Soviet Union was trying to avoid with a lot of these projects, right? Was to find work for people in these smaller places. Kartan <laughs> 